In January, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. The incoming Biden administration will face pressure on a number of fronts, not only woke activists, but also self-styled democratic socialists are expected to steer, to try to steer the Biden administration to move further toward the left. But what does that mean? What does the left mean? What, if anything, does it stand for philosophically? In its claims, its goals, and its means, how does it relate to the crusading socialism and communism that we witnessed in the last century? I'm Elon Jerna. Welcome to the New Ideal podcast. Joining me today is my colleague, Ankar Gatte, to explore this question. And we're going to dive in uh, by looking at this from the perspective of Ayn Rand's critique of the left or socialism and communism. Ankar, are you with me there? There we go. There you are. Great. Uh, all right. So I thought what we could do is just talk about sort of the wide angle issue of so why we're coming at it from this perspective and what it is that Ayn Rand had to say that was distinctive and then use that as sort of the framework for getting into the topic. And I just want to stress that we will be having a, well, I'll say more about this later on, but we'll be having a special series starting Monday, running Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, analyzing the incoming Biden administration's policies and so on. So today is not a focus on, on those concrete kind of political type issues or even the philosophical assumptions behind them, but more about sort of the intellectual ferment or movement from which uh, the Biden administration sort of has its roots and the kind of influences that it has. It's more about the philosophical uh, perspective on what is called the left. And I'm going to put air quotes one time, but it should be understood that the rest of the conversation, we're going to put that in air quotes for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. So maybe that's a good place to start, um, Ankar. So what is it we're talking about when we talk about the left? Is it, it I mean, a lot of people think of it as just sort of a political phenomenon. Um, how do you think of it? I think it includes a political phenomenon, but it has deeper cultural and philosophical roots. And even when you think of it as just at the political level, left versus right is not capturing the essence of the ideas. I mean, th those, that terminology comes from the way people were seated in parliament and they were seated to the left or to the right and they had certain views and then it became okay well the left embodies certain views the right embodies certain views you have to ask what those views are and it so it includes political i think if, if you want to think of it as it's capitalism versus statism or it's freedom versus dictatorship or even totalitarianism as the full power the the government wields over people's lives in every area. It's something like that. But though, if you think of those movements that um, this, the, the, the crusading forms of statism where government holds power and the individual is subordinate to the government is communism and socialism and fascism coming from the 19th into the 20th century. And if you think of those movements, they're not only political. So I think one one point I wanted just to get on the table as we go into this, um, when we talk about socialism and communism, there are lots of critiques of them out there. And part of what our goal is today is to bring out what is distinctive about Ayn Rand's critique of uh, sort of this way of looking at the world. And, you know, the, I remember reading people and say, and this was true during the Cold War, there are a lot of people who are, anti-left or anti-communist or anti-socialist but they the kind of view they put out was look if we can make this work this would be good but it's not going to work it's just not practical or it has really bad consequences it's bad it's being badly implemented uh but the no it's a noble ideal um, i mean i've definitely met a lot of people like that i knew people who were <laughs> committed socialists and committed communists so their view was like this is a great ideal we just got to get it working um but, you know, in contrast to that view, and then, then there's sort of the, the conservative type views that I've heard, which is, um, you know, they had bad leaders and they're, it's even evil, but it's not evil in a deep way. It's evil in its means often. Um, they'll point to bad leaders, like, look what Stalin did, look at Lenin did, and things like that. But Ayn Rand comes at this from a very different perspective in terms of her evaluation. And my understanding is that she, she thinks that the means are evil, but it's, it's that 
the ideas themselves are evil, that it's, it's unavoidable that they would lead to tyranny and destruction and slavery. I mean, is that a fair assessment? Yes, I think that's right. And it, but it's particularly the ideas that she sees at work and that are responsible for the destruction and death. So it is, if you look at the history of socialism, communism, fascism from the ni- late 19th and into the 20th century, it is a history of carnage. It's a history of destruction and death, wherever it's tried, whether it's tried uh, elements in the US or in, in the United Kingdom, Europe, you grew up there, you're familiar with the socialism that in the second half of the 20th century was, was trying to be implemented there. Or if you look in Western Europe, whether you look at fascism in Germany and Italy or socialism, communism in Russia and its satellites, they brought enormous destruction debt. So people can look politically and say, there's something wrong, or at least wrong how it was implemented by these figures. And that you're bringing up, well, it's a Stalin and a Hitler and Mussolini. They're the problem. And that view would be plausible if you thought the deeper ideas and ideals that they're trying to implement are good. And they just either were hopeless at doing it or had perverse motivations. And they, it's like, as they put now, hijacking a great religion. It's the religion's great. These people don't really take it seriously and aren't trying to implement it. Ayn Rand really challenged that perspective. What are they trying to implement? It's not just political, it's moral. There's a moral perspective here. And if you take this communist slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, that the people who are lacking something, lacking money, lacking wealth, lacking intelligence, lacking resources. They're the people who count and everybody should be subordinate morally to that. Like your whole attitude should be, I look to other people and other people who are in need and that's what I have to serve minister to. Ayn Rand thought this idea morally is monstrous and it leads to political um, destruction and death. So that's the opposite of thinking, it's noble in theory or in its moral perspective, but politically hasn't been implemented. So I, I wanna bring out an issue that I thought was really striking. Um, so anyone who had to read Marx in college or out of a curiosity will get this very strong sense that um, so the, the Marxist view is we're about the future. We're about progress. We're about creating a new world and it's sort of very friendly to, to, to technology and industry, but not in the way it's implemented under capitalism, but we would do it better under socialist uh, system. But this is a very strong emphasis on, we're not about all that superstitious stuff. Like, you know, Marx's view is religion is the opiate of the masses. And there's this question about what exactly is understood by that, but it's, yeah, we're not about religion. We're about hard science and in fact, in this kind of a historical, um, uh, uh, view that he thinks is sort of scientifically grounded. And so there's this way in which it's, it's understood as in contrast with religion, or it's presenting itself as in contrast with religion. But what you just raised about sort of the moral premise, that sounds very much like the Sermon on the Mount, is the meek shall inherit the earth. Yes, I think that's exactly right. It is, it sounds like it's the Sermon on the Mount book, because it is. It, they're the communist, socialist, and fascist. The fascists are a little more eclectic, I think, intellectually, but they're taking, all of them are taking over a moral perspective that has been predominant, I think, in the West from the rise of Christianity, which is, it puts the focus on life and morality. The pursuit of the good is not about you. It's about God and your neighbor. That is your whole, if you're to be a moral person, and particularly if you're to be an idealist of taking good and evil really seriously and building your life around, I want to be on the side of the good and not on the side of the evil, then that's morally, you have to not be focused on self, deny self, and focus on God and other people, your neighbor. The communist, socialist, fascist, 
there arise in the 19th century, it is, I'm sorry, after the, the scientific revolution, it's after the enlightenment. I think they're rebelling against the enlightenment, but it's not an open rebellion, mostly. It's not to hell with science, to hell with um, reason. We're going back to religion. They go to a neo-religion. And the, Ayn Rand talked about this a lot, that what they do is they substitute for God the state. And I think if you look at just the history and the practice of socialism, communism, fascism, and you, you think of what did religion look like when the Catholic Church really had power? And then you substitute, whether it's the Nazis in Germany, the communists in Russia, it looks very similar to when the religious people were in power, including like one party rule, thought control, all that, but it's nominally secular. And I viewed it as it's, it's faith and mysticism in another form, but it's essentially similar to religion. When you talk about the, this sort of moral perspective that you get in socialism, when you ask, well, why is it that you have to be concerned with the needy? Why must it be that that's the focus? What, you know, I, I don't think in my readings that, that I've ever seen a good answer to that. And it sort of, where does that lead to? If you trace back sort of the justification for it, what, what's the basis for that? I don't think there is a justification. Um, so it is, if you go back to the religious view, it's you're ordered to do this. And if you think of what is essential to the religious view, and that, for instance, pride is the worst sin. It's taking your own life, values, thoughts, goals seriously. And seriously here means, in a philosophical sense, it means as ends. Like this is what my life is about. Achieving happiness, uh, forming my own ideas, coming to think what I think is true, and holding fast to that. It's a radical selfishness. It's a, it's a radical, you're focused on yourself, your ideas, your values, your life, your happiness. And if religion is trying to take that away, one aspect is, no, you should be focused on God. That, precisely because it's, no one's encountered God, they don't have evidence for it. It takes a certain kind of mind to say, yeah, I'm going to subordinate myself to nothing. That is nothing that I've encountered. And to put as a kind of substitute, if you can't do that, what you need to do is serve your neighbor. And particularly what you need to do is it's your neighbor who's suffering in pain, in misery. And so on. It's, you're going to have to abandon all your, what your goals in life are, your values. Are. That's the dynamic, I think. There's not a justification, but there's a certain logic to it. If you think of the target is, to stop people from viewing their own minds and lives as this is an end, I'm a sovereign being, I'm not tied to other things who are telling me what to do. And if you wanna tell them what to do, you have to give some kind of logic to why it makes sense that don't listen to what you think, listen to what other people think. So uh, I think we, we should move the conversation to this sort of the American context of what is what has been manif what have been some manifestations of the left or the socialist ideas in America, uh, and sort of Ayn Rand's perspective on that um, carried forward. So, I think America has been unusual. I mean, this is the sense in which it's exceptional. I mean, this was the criticism of it as exceptional. It, it didn't succumb to sort of the socialist ideas in the way that other countries did. And, but there has been definitely a push. And so there was the progressive movement in the 20th century that pushed in this direction and lots of other kind of forms of this. But if we bring it into sort of the political arena in the United States, and as Ayn Rand observed it in her lifetime, um, how did she view the relationship between what are thought of as the, sort of the liberals in, in the American context or the left and socialists in other countries and communists? I think one aspect um, is that, as you say, the, the, it, communism, socialism, fascism never takes hold 
in the U.S. in the way that it does in other countries, including throughout uh, much of Europe. It, and it has to do both with the American ideas and ideals. The, uh, the, the, in the Declaration of Independence, that what life is about is about the pursuit of happiness. That's a rejection of Marx's view and, and all its precursors that it's your life doesn't count, you should serve those in need. So there's both ideas in America that are opposed to what the push of socialism, communism, fascism was. And then the American, um, the whole creation over two centuries of America is it, it was a place where people who valued their own lives came from across the world and wanted to come to America because in America they could pursue their own happiness. And so at the, at the just the way Ayn Rand would put it, at the sense of life level of Americans, they don't think in the terms that communism and socialism and fascism were meant to appeal to. They don't think of themselves as falling in classes. I'm the proletariat or the bourgeoisie. No, I'm me, an individual, out to pursue my happiness. They don't think like that, and they don't think that the rich are there exploiting them. They, want to, they wanted to come to a place where everybody could rise as far as their ability and productivity would take them. And it was better to live among people who are creating light bulbs and oil industry, automobiles and so on. I wanna live in that. So they didn't look, that's part of the class. They didn't view themselves as like, I'm the oppressed. And they didn't view people who were productive and creating as they're oppressing me. So they didn't view the whole world as the, the oppressed and the oppressors. So the, the but nevertheless, she thought of America as drifting towards more socialism. And indeed, she worried about fascism. You could talk some about that. I know you're interested in that in her view of the Kennedy administration. It, but we were drifting. It was never a crusade for this. But so long as the ideas that are embedded in the communist, socialism, fascist point of view, if they were not ex explicitly opposed, they're going to push in a certain direction. And that's the sense we're drifting. There's a wider current that we're in that's leading in a certain way, but we're not crusading for it. And America wasn't moving in the way that Germany is saying uh, towards Nazism. Well, this is probably the, the, a good time to, to raise the sort of explain a bit why I, at the beginning I said the left, and I, I, I use air quotes or scare quotes. Um, and I think this is, I take her view to be from what she's written that the, you know, at the time she's commenting on cultural political issues, so sort of actively as a big focus, she's looking at, at the sort of the liberals and the left politically and culturally. And she has the same criticism of them as she has of the conservatives, which is it, it, these are very, these are vague labels and they seem deliberately vague to avoid having to be pinned down on what are really the issues at stake. And it's not really clear what people are advocating for. And it, so it's, they're not socialist in the sense that you, if you went to Germany, you'd find people like that. When the UK who are actually have, you know, manifestos calling for the nationalization of industry and so on, they don't have those kinds of views, but they're kind of leaning in that direction. They want to go towards more of a, welfare state uh, approach. So that's, uh, and I think part of her critique, at least what this aspect of it is, it's, it's cowardly or, or kind of um, hiding what it's trying to do. And there's a sense, and you, you put it in terms of America was drifting because there was no opposition. And part of what she says about the liberals is that they don't want to admit to themselves what their goal is or has been. And it is this sort of drift towards more government involvement in the economy and in growing the welfare state. And it's a it's sort of this dynamic of moving in a direction of kind of, uh, she puts it, I think, smuggling the country towards welfare statism. Uh, so unadmitted goals. And so it's a really interesting point because you know, a common account of America is that the um, the conservative movement is standing athwart history, yelling no. And in her view, is 
yeah, all you're doing on the right or the conservatives is at best you're slowing things down. You're not really stopping it. You're not really an opposition. And the people pushing or, or causing the drift are themselves not willing to admit to what the, the core issue is. And I think as, as she watched what was happening as she lived through the 20th century in America, it went from the earlier conservatives, people who would say they're on the side of free enterprise, they rarely have ever used the term capitalism. I think she revived that as thinking of what the distinctively American system is capitalism. But they talked about free enterprise and something. I think she thought of it as the way you put it was that they're at best slowing the, the movement and as I put it, it's a drifting towards uh, socialism, statism. I think she thought they went from that to now you're actively aiding it. So the more the conservatives took up the same moral ideals, and here, I mean, and she was from the 60s talking about they're embracing religion, and they're embracing particularly for that we religion will give us values. It's we'll get morality from religion. And that that Marx and as we talked about that it's from each according to his ability to each according to his need. She thought that is that's a religious viewpoint. That's altruism that you don't count. It's all for the sake of other people. That came from religion. And as the as the um, so-called people on the side of freedom, capitalism, free enterprise started saying more and more, yes, that's what morality is about. That's what va values are. And we get it from, um, not from some godless thing. We get it from God and religion. You're now hastening the move towards these things. So it went from, yeah, at best, you help slow it down a little bit, but you're never confronting the essential issue. So you'll never be able to change direction and convince people, look, there's some better ideas out there. And then it became, oh, you're part of the problem. You're, you're one of the forces pushing us in the direction of status. Yeah, I, I was listening to an interview that Ayn Rand gave many years ago, I think it was 1962. Um, and she's, she, or actually I think it was a, a talk as well. Um, and she's analyzing the debate between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. I think when they were running for uh, president. And she says, th this really, I mean, it's, I thought it was startling because she, she defends this, but it's really startling when you see it. She says that they, both of them on the stage at the time, she described them both as salesmen for socialism. Like they're, they're in, in essence, sort of in terms of the, the moral framework that they bring, mm -hmm. they both kind of accept it in some way. And her view is that they both presume to dispose of people's lives and property. And that's sort of the essential issue for her on that point. And that she, she was particularly appalled in this situation, in this context with Richard Nixon saying, um, don't take, don't get me wrong. I agree with you. We just differ on some particulars. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think for her, this was one of the pieces of evidence that the sort of the conservative side of the, the political landscape, as she saw it at the time, was part of the problem, as you put it. It was, it was contributing to this drift, um, failing to oppose or rather failing to defend the positives on rational grounds. Yeah, and the point you brought up about, uh, you brought up earlier about that it's, they don't really know what they're doing and they're in some ways trying to escape knowing where they're going. Another theme that runs through her writings of this period is the pragmatism that is engulfing uh, the American mind. And pragmatism is, again, it's, it's not just a political issue, it's a, it's a philosophical movement that is essentially American in its trappings, in its deeper ideas, it's not, but in its trappings, that it, this is what it means to be practical, we wanna do what works, we're not these ivory tower, lost in the clouds kind of people, we're hard headed, practical, we deal with reality. This is a movement, an intellectual philosophical movement in the late 19th century that really sweeps in America, particularly American education. Dewey is one of the pragmatists and he has a big impact on the 
education from primary school. And the consequence, one of the essentials, she thought of what pragmatism really is, is that abstractions and principles don't work. And if you don't have abstractions and principles to guide you, you have no idea what, where you're going long-term. So in, think of the contrast, the crusading socialist communist, it's we want to abolish private property. That's the root of all our problems, it's the root of evil. We have to get rid of it. It's going to be public ownership, which means government is going to take over all property. And that's the sense in which you get to, to totalitarianism. The government has, controls all property, it wields total power in the end. And what you get in America is more, no, no, we're not, that's crazy. We're not going to say we're going to take over and abolish private property, no private property free enterprise, that's part of the American way and, and the American way of life. So we're, no, we're, no, but we're going to, okay, your retirement, no, you don't get to control that. We're going to take your money and we're going to have run social security. You're no longer in control. It's no longer private property. It's government money and a government program. And in healthcare, oh no, well, that's too important to leave to private individuals. So we're going to take over more elements of uh, the healthcare, we're going to have a Medicare program, so education, that's really important. So we can't leave that to private individuals and private property. Government's going to start taking over more and more education. So it was in these various areas, it's, oh no, we can't allow private property to work. But don't tell us we're abolishing private property. And that's if pragmatists can't think with abstractions, can't see the principle, and is told don't look for the principles. Principles are useless. Don't even bother about them. He doesn't see what he's actually doing. And that was part of her perspective. Like she thinks of Richard Nixon as a pragmatist. And he re- there's a fundamental sense in which he doesn't know what he's doing. So you, the way you put it was interesting. To, so they, they're not looking at principles. They don't think they need to. And as a result, they don't see the long-term implications. In the way you described the uh, sort of the, the areas of life that would now be, oh, this is too important. Government's going to run it, healthcare, education, and so forth. Uh, what struck me about that is she has an analysis of America's sort of the, the, the direction that she's worried America is heading in, um, which was not America is going to become this socialist country. If you look at Scandinavia or the United Kingdom at the time, it was more that it was heading towards fascism. And, and particularly she was worried about what the Kennedy administration was trying to do because it was anti, I mean, her analysis was as anti-intellectual, sort of really hostile to principles. And this brings to mind her analysis of what fascism looks like in practice, which is it's the sort of the facade of private ownership, the facade of freedom and private property but in fact, so much control by the government in the background that you can't, you don't really have freedom. You can't really make certain decisions um, about your life and your property. Uh, so say a bit about, so why she, she called, um, I think Kennedy's major program was called the New Frontier, but she, she renamed it the fascist New Frontier. I mean, do you think just maybe you can give us some light on that? Yeah, I think what you brought up is the essential reason that it became more and more what the government is going to do is dictate how individuals, corporations, businesses can use their private property. One of the episodes in the Kennedy administration is the incredible intimidation of the steel industry. And it's not always what it, and it wasn't essentially what's going on in America. We're going to nationalize everything. So they did nationalize something. But it's not we're going to nationalize the whole economy. It's no, you nominally still are the owners of this company, of this industry. But we're going to tell you from A to Z what you can and cannot do. We're going to order you around. And one of the ways she put it, I think, is that so you have all the disadvantages of owning property. You're still supposedly responsible. When things go bad, everybody blames the business and the corporation. But you don't have any actual control. The government can dictate everything, can tax how much it wants, can tell you you can do this, you cannot do that. And in in giving government this kind of control where it's not the explicit abolishing of private property, 
but it is the abolishing of if property means I get to decide how it's going to be used, who I'm going to sell to and so on. That was going away. And she viewed the antitrust laws as the first real death blow to American capitalism. And I think if you think of antitrust laws from this perspective, they're fascist laws. It's yeah, you still get to own these businesses and so on. But if we think you're too big, Facebook, we're going to break you up. Or GE, we're going to, I mean, I heard that. GE, we're going to break you up. Alcoa, we're going to break you up. We're not going to allow you to merge. We're not going to allow you to enter this product line. So it was government dictating. It's still nominal that there's private property, but there's not in essence. And that's fascism. I, I, I want to bring up some of the sort of cultural manifestations of what was happening and that she was responding to at the time, because I think it, it, there are important aspects of her critique that are, we should um, talk about. One of the things that, you know, we, we talked about earlier is that it, in a deep way, the socialists as intellectuals, as philosophers, were just were taking over religious moral premises, moral foundations. And that the argument was, in a sense, well, there's no real argument here. You just have to do this. This is what is, this is your commandment, in effect, but uh, couched in, in sort of socialist lingo and in very heavy books and, and so forth. Uh, but what one of the things she points out um, is that there's a kind of shift in the left uh, from what she describes as the old left, which is the more sort of intellectual concerned with theory and sort of making efforts to present arguments or at least more intellectually seeming in its in its approach to what she described and I think a lot of people called it this is not her term but this is sort of the new phenomenon that she had an interesting analysis for is called the new left right there was a, it's like a self-conscious movement that was saying we're taking whatever the left is we're taking it in a new direction we're going to have a new kind of uh, phenomenon. And the thing that struck me in reading her analysis of this is that, you know, looking at it from the outside, you might say, well, it's new younger people and they have different priorities and the different political goals and there's different strategies. And, and, and for her, those aren't nearly fundamental in terms of explaining what's happening with the new left. Her analysis is the, the left all of the, the sort of pretense it had to being concerned with reason and facts and science, all of that's falling away. Like the, the mask is coming off and the real essence of what the left has always been is now more naked, is naked and more of sort of um, on mm -hmm. display. And when we talk about the new left, I didn't live through this, so I know this through history, but for people listening who, who are sort of in a similar situation, the new left is when you start seeing student riots on college campuses and the takeover of universities. And then um, it's part of the new left. There was a bombing campaign, I believe by one faction that called itself the weather underground, which I think is, I think it's fair to call them part of the new left. So you get these really kind of um, militant uh, um, action oriented. And uh, sort of another element of the new left, I guess is, is it's fair to, capture this uh, sort of the, the whole Woodstock phenomenon and the, and the hippies and, and, and that kind of cultural manifestation of it, not that they had a political goals, but that kind of uh, indulgence in uh, emotionalism and, and uh, uh, really different ways of, of living, which I think are sort of well understood as sort of the part of the new phenomenon that was confronting people. Yes, and I'd add one, I think you put it as reason, something, and science. I, I, I forget what your third one was, uh, but I had a fourth, which is progress. Mm -hmm. And the, I think that's the, that, there's, that there's an intellectual cultural crisis in the late, like second half of the 60s, but 60s, 70s. I think one has to see it in terms of progress as well. So what socialism, communism, fascism, promise, whether they had, whether there was ever reason to believe this promise, I think the answer is no. But what they promised was progress. We were going to outstrip capitalism. We were going to outstrip America. It, and many American intellectuals and Western intellectuals thought this, that Russia is going to surpass the West. 
because they've got the better system and they've adopted socialism, communism. They're now all pursuing the common good. They want to industrialize. They're going to get power for everybody. It's going to be abundance. And that, so that was what was promised, that this is better than what you have. It's better than American freedom, capitalism, free enterprise. And the reality, the reality quickly was, no, it's not anything like this. It's wholesale destruction, death. That's what you see early, I think, in Russia. But it was transparently clear by World War II and the aftermath of World War II. Of, and here you see all what fascism led to as well, that it's destructive for its own people. It's destructive for its neighbors. It's, it's, it's massively bad. And like the idea that this, oh, this is the path to progress, nobody could seriously think that after World War II. And so the grappling with that is what the, the transition from the old left, the more card carrying marks of socials to the new is grappling with that issue. Are we gonna face the fact that what the essential thing we promised, we achieved the opposite of what we said our goal was and what we were trying to do. And are we gonna squarely face that or are we going to evade it in certain kinds of ways? And I think the for view of the new left is it's a form of evading it. But there's, but there's a pivot point and that's why the culture is sort of noted, as you put it, like her, it's not her term, the new left. People were noticing there's some real significant shift going on. And she has a deep analysis of what is leading to that shift and the nature of the shift. But I think that's the way that she's thinking about it. It's, it's bankrupt. She talks a lot at this period about we're in a state of bankruptcy. So before we go on, I just should mention we, we are welcoming questions. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A module. And for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, Super Chat questions will get priority. Uh, so. To, to your point, Ankar, about the sort of this pivot and the new phenomenon, the new left. Uh, so she 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 has a, a talk, I think, becomes an essay, the anti-industrial revolution, and mm -hmm. that is her. I think being really prescient about what's developing, kind of flowing out of the new left, which is this. Um, view that becomes the ecology movement, renamed the, becomes the environmentalist movement, and which is now essentially a mainstream view, is the default view for most people that the you know human life is inherently destructive of nature. There's this inherent conflict that we are on the wrong side of, and we we have to make amends for all the ways in which we're harming nature. And her analysis, part, part of what's distinctive here is that it was, this is not an essentially scientific movement. It's, a, it's an ideological movement. It's a hostility to progress and capitalism. And though, though there are scientific questions and we can just bracket those for a moment, I think it's worth coming back to, but that's not the essence of what this movement is about. Uh, and one of the things that I think is interesting here is that as a, sort of how this is the sort of development from the this sort of socialist communist uh, origins, which is, and the pivot, she says that in the past, the, the criticism of capitalism was that it created poverty. And now the shift was, no, the problem with capitalism is creating abundance, there's too much stuff. And that is a way in which, and that to your point about, the, yeah, this is a kind of bankruptcy. Like it's coming and going, it's, it's, it's wrong if it creates too, too little, it's wrong if it creates too much. Yeah. And it's, you put it, the, if you think of it as I was putting, there's a real pivot point. It's um, abundance is the problem. Another way to put it, that is progress is the problem. So when you're faced with, look, we advocated ideas and ideals that we said, they're on the side of reason, they're on the side of science, they're on the side of progress. And then you see the actual manifestations in Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia. They don't look like they're on the side of reason. They're not on the side of science. And they're certainly not on the side of progress. So the, if you're 
being honest, it will be, okay, there's something really wrong with how we've been thinking about this. There's something really wrong with our ideas. Not with the goal, not with the goal that well, progress is good, to be reasonable and rational is good, science is good. This is what, all things that come with the enlightenment. It's not the goals that are a problem. It's the ideas that we thought would lead to that. We're, we're radically mistaken about that. And what instead happens is they renounce the goals. It's, okay, well, to hell with progress. To hell, well, yeah, abundance is now a problem. It's, this is what's destroying us. We need to get rid of it. To hell with science. And to hell with reason. One of the, um, you brought up Woodstock. Ayn Rand has a very interesting essay, uh, Apollo and Dionysus, where she's talking about that in, in comparison to the Apollo moon launch um, and the uh, Apollo program. And one is on the so side of science, reason, and what this new phenomenon and new movement is embracing is the goals that are the antithesis of reason, science, progress. And that, I mean, that's monstrous to embrace those goals, but that's sort of the choice. Will we question our ideas or will we renounce these goals? And instead of questioning their ideas, they renounce the goals. Um, and in American terms, they renounce the pursuit of happiness. Um, thanks to those of you on the Super Chat for your contributions and support, we appreciate it. And thanks for the questions too. We'll, we'll try to get to those in a few minutes. Just a couple more things I, I thought we should raise, just a few more aspects of her view that um, really distinctive and worth emphasizing. So we talked a little about how she saw the, the sort of the rise of what will become environmentalism as a phenomenon uh, early on. I think she was uh, ahead of uh, most people in terms of its significance and what moral evaluation to have of it. Uh, there's two other things I wanted just to tease out, which I think are part of her critique. Um, you know, one of the things that socialism has always promised was goodwill among men. And, you know, we won't have conflicts, we won't have uh, alienation of the worker from the from his labor, we won't have this friction with capital and labor, all sorts of accounts of ways in which human life was inherently conflict ridden. And, you know, in the socialist utopia, you're supposed to end up with, yeah, everyone's friends, we're all, we're all brothers and so on. And I have to say, <laughs> I, I have spent time on a kibbutz, which is a socialist commune when I was a kid and my grandparents uh, helped found one and were involved in it. My mother grew up on it. So I spent a lot of time there. And my impression just as a child was there's no goodwill here. It's the opposite. There's just so much friction in fact. Um, and this, so that's anecdotal. You might, you might find counter arguments and so on. But the, the reality I think is when you, when you take away people's freedom and they take away your, their control over their life. It, it inherently creates friction. But there's a way in which, and I think this was told, this is on a large scale, you saw this in the communist bloc, for sure, in East Germany, and all the ways in which the, the, the system is almost calculated to create uh, conflict and, and ill will. But there's an aspect of sort of the new left development that I think is, we're, we're living through it right now, which is, is I think of as, a really uh, powerful stoking of a problem, which is uh, racism and tribalism. And I think what happens is the old left is about class structure and class struggle. And that kind of falls by the wayside and it becomes more, it, you get different versions of it. You get sort of, um, um, uh, sort of different kinds of grouping, some of which are racial, some of which are gender. And this sort of fracturing uh, into society, into tribes, it's, it's another form of collectivism. It's not workers versus capital. It's, it, you know, it's this ethnicity versus that. And that I think is, it's an outgrowth of that kind of thinking. Uh, and it, it really is, it, it's a poison to human relationships. Um, and, and it's sort of deep rooted, right? I mean, it's not like it's, it's an accident that you get this kind of collectivism. Yeah, that, that's an important point that you're bringing up. And we actually saw very early on that what we're going to get is a rise in racism and tribalism. And the essential philosophical issue is if you tell people reason doesn't work, you can't figure things out 
you can't proceed logically, scientifically. You're essentially an emotional creature who is uh, pushed around by external forces. You're, you can't guide yourself. You can't, in any fundamental sense, think for yourself, figure out what you think is true, valuable, and pursue it. The more that's pounded into people, and the, the, you, again, you brought up the Woodstock, example when you watch some of that footage read some of the interviews with people these are people who are not thinking have no long-range perspective of what they're trying to do Ayn Rand talks about this like they don't even know how they're going to get food the next day where they're going to sleep it's they're sort of rolling around in the mud but not sort of like that's what they were doing that the more you reduce people to that animal level the more the world looks animalistic. That is that people are at loggerheads with one another. They can't understand each other. There's no means of communication. There's no shared ideas. There's no shared values. And at an individual level, it's your identity no longer comes from the content of your character, to use the Martin Luther uh, King phrase, because you don't have any control over the content of the character. Your identity comes from the group you're in, your ancestry, the language you speak, your skin color, that's how you have to think about yourself. And that's what tribalism looks like. That's how tribes differentiate between each other. It's not, we've got better ideas than that one. It's the, we don't like to look at their face or the color of their skin. And I mean, my understanding of tribalism is that it's, as you put it, you're, you don't have control over your kind of your character and these other factors, they're external to you. They're often, I mean, almost always unchosen and, and um, yes. typically they're biological and, or, or even just, well, I happen to grow up in this kind of family. So that's my religion. And this is my political views. So it, it really puts your control of your life in the hands of the group and so it's sort of a denial of free will i mean it's a deep denial of your capacity to direct your own life and mind yeah it yes it, it's the and, it, and that's the sense of the, it's it's as you put it it's collectivism and this is why the issues are much deeper than politics this is a way that people are being taught to think about themselves their identity and it's that there's really no such thing as the individual. All there is are different groups. And that's what you have to look to for guidance. That's what you have to cling to. And if that's the way people are thinking about themselves at an individual level of action and of thinking of what's right and wrong, by the time you get to politics, that they'll think the only option is some form of collectivism. That is, is it going to be socialism or communism or fascism? That it's... That's inevitable if people have thought that these deeper philosophical cultural ideas. And so when she's talking about the new left, it's not just politics. That she's talking about. So we should uh, get to some of these questions that have come yeah. in. And I have a question for you actually that I wanna add to some of these if we can get to it. Um, so these are, some of them are um, a little peripheral to the, the main subject, but we can kind of try to weave them in and, and integrate them a bit. So there's a question here about, I think, healthcare workers and their view of themselves. Um, so the, I'll just try to summarize this. So it's, they've been, particularly in the pandemic, they've been working tirelessly and they're among the heroes in our culture. Uh, but the perspective a lot of people have, including people who are in the healthcare fields, they view themselves as they're acting selflessly. Um, and the, the question is asking, what can be done to change this? Because it's not, the question is, it disagrees with this assessment. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's, you need to challenge altruism is what does it need to change this fundamentally? And from this perspective, I think when you talk to individual nurses and doctors, and I know you've done that as well, Alon, so you should talk about some of your experience with that. They're not motivated by thinking, yeah, I'm not interested in this work, in this career. It's not personally meaningful and valuable to me, but I was looking for the best way to be a servant for other people. And this seemed like the best way. So that's why I'm doing it. That's at, when you're talking at an individual level, 
that's not the motivation. The motivation is I'm interested in this work of combating disease, of moving people towards health. Um, the people are value to me. So it's not like I hate people, so, but I'm trading with them. I'm not their servant or slave. I'm providing them a tremendous value. I expect to be paid for this and to be appreciated for doing this. I expect it to be a real trade, and but it's what I'm doing is enormously valuable. I'm personally interested in, to, in, in it. And I'm gonna dedicate my life and my career towards this. But when it becomes now at a kind of societal level of, to describe what is going on and what, um, what is the profession of nursing or being a doctor about, if you put it, it's about creating real value. It's about trading. It's about um, pursuing money and profit not at the expense of your patients, but you're expected to be paid for this and paid well because it's enormously valuable what you're doing. Then that will be branded, yeah, but that doesn't sound right morally, that's selfish. There's something perverse about this. So whenever it's described at a more public social level, it's, oh yeah, what they're just, they're servants, they're slaves to other people. Look how what they do for other people. They don't care about themselves and so on. That's not true for most doctors and nurses, and it shouldn't be true. They should, what they are doing is enormously valuable and they should think of it like that. And they should think of that life is about trade, both about money, but more widely about, we esteem doctors, nurses and so on, because we know what they do is enormously valuable and we want people doing that and we're happy to trade with them. Um, let's take a, a, couple, a few more questions. So this one is about, uh, is asking, can we talk about the psychological reasons people gravitate toward this movement? I understand that to mean sort of the left in quotes generally. And it, if one can understand what the errors or psychological errors involve, uh, what can be done to change that? So I, I want to just reframe that a little bit because I'm not a psychologist. I don't feel I can speak to that, although um, I think there might be interesting psychological things. But just taking it more broadly, what might explain uh, some of the appeal of this. And I think the, the framing I want to bring is there is a kind of um, intensified um, appeal of socialism. Like we have this whole phenomenon of democratic socialists um, and polls suggesting that young people, it's not clear how valid these polls are, but suggesting young people are more sympathetic to these views. Um, how do you think of that sort of in the contemporary context, you know, what, what is it that, because we've seen the sort of the, anyone who's curious can see the effects of these systems in practice and should take that and should take that seriously, but it seems that nevertheless, there's some appeal to these ideas. The most significant positive appeal, I think is precisely what we were talking about earlier that morality seems to be on this side. That if morality really is about uh, other people subordinating yourself to them, what Ayn Rand called altruism, or placing others first, and they're the primary focus morally. If that's really what morality is about, then something, some kind of system that implements that seems to be the correct system, the right system, the good system. And if I'm, as a young person, genuinely interested in doing what's right and what's good, this is the side that I need to be on. And I'm not too sure what the system is. So we're seeing a revival of socialism, that it's no longer a dirty word. It's, it's something positive about it. When you ask young people, well, what is socialism? And you don't get very much of an answer. And I don't think you get typically sort of they're quoting Marx or communism. It's the abolishment of private property. and so. But it's something about we're all doing this together and pursuing the common good. And we're doing what's right. And it's social. That's the focus. And it, that's, the, I think, one of its principal positive appeals. And so long as that is all over the culture, that the culture in effect is telling them, yeah, you're right, that is what is moral. It will have an appeal to young people. So I, I wanna ask you a question building on that, which I've been interested in for a while. And 
so there's an observation that you, a number of you have made uh, that if you think about the thinking about the implementation of socialism and so take the Soviet bloc, the number of people killed as a result of the deliberate policies of the Soviets is in the tens of millions easily, a result of various famines that were engineered and just the system and how it, and then uncountable people who are just dehumanized by the system. And you look at the death toll of the fascists or particularly the Nazi regime in Germany, which was horrific. Uh, and I, I don't mean to compare the two, but I, I think it's, it's telling that Nazi is rightly a a horrible term to use for somebody. So the, the epitome of the most evil thing people can think about. And yet when you think about, well, communists killed a lot of people and why is communism and socialism, and even Marx, why, why are they still reputable uh, in, in important ways in the way that, not that I'm, I mean, it should be that they should be at least as bad if not worse in the way people see it. So how do you think about that? Hmm. Part of the way I think about it is the, on the issue of weakness. So if the focus on others really becomes the you know, Marxist phrase, again, from each according to ability to each according to his need, and the more in need someone is, the more they count. That is morally, they're the goal, the end, to try to help them, serve them, subordinate oneself to their lives and what they need, the more you think that that's what morality is about, then anything that seems focused on those in need, the weak, the helpless, has a moral standing that you can't knock away, even if you say, well, look, but in practice, it's led to all kinds of destruction. So, but yeah, there's still something noble and right in theory about it. Whereas the Nazis are not thought of like that. They're thought of, they're about strength, the master race, advancing the German cause so at the expense of everybody else. And that makes it, it's not just, oh yeah, in practice, this is a disaster. But in theory, no, we don't think that. This isn't about the weakness and those in need. It's about strength and the German people asserting themselves. And there's something wrong with that. So Nazism gets put into a very different category. As well. it's a, I think it's a different moral category. So uh, we just received a, a question on the super chat right under the wire. So let's include it uh, before we wrap up. Uh, do you think the quote left has influenced intellectuals at the World Economic Forum and their new proposal called the Great Reset? Uh, actually, so I, haven't, I haven't read. Yeah. I don't know, have you read about the no, not, proposal? Not yet, but I have some knowledge of the World Economic Forum. But uh, do you yeah, want go to, ahead. I was going to say, I, I think in, in important ways, if we think of the quote left as um, intellectual life influenced by the legacy of Marxism and communism and just that, that moral perspective of uh, each according to his, you know, as you put it earlier, just sort of moving away from uh, individualism towards the group and, and serving the needy in society. That, I think that moral framework is really fundamental in society. And it, my assessment is it really put, it's kind of framed a lot of the, the debates in important ways and sort of set the terms of the, a lot of debates. And then the question often is, well, we know we have to do this, but how do we do it? What's the best way? And then there's debates on the, the, the implementation. Well, the welfare state needs to be this big. No, it needs to be just a safety net, not a whole big apparatus. We don't want what they have in, in Europe. We just want something to catch people when they fall. But the basic moral framework is, is set. It's sort of the terms of the debate, the moral. Um, and I think that's sort of what you see in, in intellectual life and including in political e economy is that the terms are uh, taken as settled, the moral terms are taken as settled, then people debate, well, we want it to pull it a little bit this way and a little bit that. So I think it definitely had a huge impact uh, on um, sort of the thinking there. Um, and I think the other way to see it is, earlier we talked about how, so Ayn Rand's critique of the, the, the political right, or uh, as, as it put that in quotes, or the conservative movement in America, and part of it was, there. It, it's not a, 
a coherent and cogent positive opposition. It's not putting forward something uh, um, uh, clear and, and um, intellectually rigorous as a, as a better alternative. And it was just sort of helping along that trend. And I think that that's missing in intellectual life. It's not limited to sort of the dynamic between the conservatives and the liberals in the United States. There isn't really kind of positive uh, advocacy for better ideas. And the consequence is that that drift is, is really strong. It's not, it's not like it's been abated in any significant way. So I think that has to be part of the way you look at these sorts of developments. Yeah, I think, and, and if we put it in American terms, who today talks about the individual's pursuit of his own happiness? Nobody, I think. And that includes the so-called right conservatives. The, the, that individualism, which is the whole atmosphere of the first century and a half of America, that that's what we're ideal is about, is about this, the individual. That no longer exists and doesn't exist in the world economic forms. Intellectuals have turned away from that. And that part of that movement is the left, old and new, pushing hard philosophically against that individual, that it's all wrong. Well, we're at time, so let's uh, sort of close out today. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things that has come out or one of the takeaways is that there's it, it, this issue is really much deeper than the way it's often thought of. It's not primarily a political kind of issue. I mean, it has political manifestations, it's important politically, but it is a deep philosophic phenomenon and that Ayn Rand's critique is itself a philosophic critique. It's not just these policies are gonna destroy us. It's here's the, here are the philosophic reasons why you see this manifestation and what its meaning really is in society. And I would recommend that we'll put these uh, links in the show notes for people. I mentioned the anti-industrial revolution, which you can find on the Institute's website. You can listen to that. Uh, and it's a, there's a book by the same name. Uh, the other one I think that would be worth recommending is um, Faith and Force, Destroyers of the Modern World. And I think the one more that would be relevant for people to take a look at uh, some of the um, material in the Ayn Rand lexicon where you can look up different issues. So she talks about socialism, communism, she differentiates it from fascism and her, some of her uh, views on sort of the liberals and the, and the left of uh, sort of contemporaneous uh, with her own analysis of those. Uh, so those are the things that come to mind for me any others you'd recommend? Just say a word about the, the, the book you mentioned. So, the, so the, the, it's the new left, the anti-industrial revolution. And the anti-industrial revolution is the last essay in it. But it's the, that book, it meant, which is now called, with some additional essay, Return of the Primitive. Mm -hmm. But it was originally called the new left. And it was, you get her analysis of how she's looking at, there's a real intellectual cultural change happening. And this is what it looks like to really understand it in philosophical terms. Yeah. And so then the final thing I would say before we close is to uh, let you know that starting uh, next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will be doing a, a series of broad, uh, live stream podcasts, uh, analyzing different aspects of the incoming Biden administration, We're looking at it, uh, domestic policy, economics, we're looking at healthcare, and we'll be looking at uh, its views on energy and environment. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be a really interesting analysis. Uh, I'll be there with you on car. And I think uh, Keith and uh, Keith Lockage and Ben Bear will be part of the series too. So we hope to see you uh, here.